Hey everybody, Mark Russell's here, the Director of Education for the Zildjian Vickfirth Companies. I'm joined by Joe Testa, the Vice President of Artist Relations for Zildjian, and Mark DiCiani, who is the Professor of Drum Set at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Also a researcher and clinician and just all around great guy. Welcome to the, <laughs> welcome to the, uh, <laughs> The project here, at Mark. So, Mark yeah. is uh, has a really wide, varied background into not only drumming and teaching drum set and and a lot of things, but also is a researcher into new, neurology. But before we get into that, Mark, tell us about your background. I know that you uh, you played with a few guys in the past. I have. I played with a bunch of folks. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, I. I Finished college in Philly and moved out to LA and went on tour with a couple of people. I started on tour with a guy named Ben Vereen, who actually I've returned to touring with now for a little while. Uh, amazing human being and singer, dancer, actor, etc. cetera. Uh, but while in LA, um, I picked up other gigs when I wasn't on tour with Ben and I played with people like Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. And, uh, worked as a house drummer for NBC for a while, playing pre-records for uh, TV shows uh, of all sorts. Played the Tonight Show a few times. Um, let's see. Uh, played with a lot of jazz people. Uh, Randy Brecker, John Faddis. Actually had the good fortune to play with Michael Brecker w one time before he passed. Uh, Grover Washington, the late, great Pat Martino. Uh, Robin Eubanks, a lot of jazz people also played some percussion uh, with uh, Rod Stewart, the, the Moody Blues, uh, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, um, uh, Roger Daltrey, some, some of those kind of folks. So I've done a lot of different things like that playing. Um, I've been teaching at the university where I was director of school of music, then I became a dean, then a university dean, a college dean, and now I'm back teaching full time and doing my research and joined uh, on a research team with Jefferson University Hospital um, to research some of the issues that we'll probably get to talk about today in, in neuroscience and cognitive psychology and those areas. Wow. So. <laughs> There's just a couple of things just, going on here. Just a few things. <laughs> <laughs> so you pretty early on, you you got into research. I mean, not pretty early on. I mean, you played with Frank Sinatra. So, you know, that's a relative term. But when did you get into just being interested in how the brain works and neurology as a whole when it comes to drumming and teaching? I, I think my my first uh, interest, well, m my dad was an engineer, so uh, he taught me to uh, look for data and not really go into anything with uh, prejudiced or presupposed ideas. And I remember reading an article, uh, maybe 12, 15 years ago in Modern Drummer, where, where somebody talked about uh, playing in jazz time. And I still remember that the, the sentence, it, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, it's something to do with the reason that if you're right-handed, we play jazz time with our right hand is because that's where our fine motor controls are. And I remember reading that and I didn't know anything what a fine motor control was or right-handed, left-handed, never really thought about it. But I remember reading that and thinking to myself, is that true? I mean, if, if it is true, what are fine motor controls? And, you know, I'm able to do a lot of things with my left hand, so don't I have fine motor controls there too? So that, that started me on doing research into how the hands work, how the brain works, how the nervous system, neural pathways, um, and also, also how, how, would that, how would that work with a left-handed person? They have the opposite? Well, it's interesting, but we actually have the same number of mecha, what's called mechanoreceptors, which basically are fine motor controls, uh, in both hands in each of our fingers. They're basically the same. The finest points are in our, our uh, index finger and our distal pad. That's not the most, but certainly one of the most sensitive areas in our body. But our hands are basically equal. We are bimanual beings. What we choose to do in terms of maybe writing 
with our right hand or you know with our left hand doesn't necessarily mean that that's what hand we are since some of that is preference some of it is culture some of it is different in different countries uh the percentage of right-handed versus left-handed etc but we are bimanual beings. We do things, aside from, let's say, we write with our right hand, we do things with both of our hands all day long, whether it's drive a car, um, certainly play drums, but pick up coffee, you know, do things around the house, open doors. We do things with both of our hands all the time. Neuroplasticity or neuroplasticity, or sometimes called brain plasticity, basically means and, and this is a new development in the last, I'd say, 12 to 15 years with all the fMRIs and, and scans. The brain is considered now plastic, and it's considered this is a fact that it's plastic, which means not, not that it's actually made of plastic, but it's plastic in that it's malleable and changeable. And it's changeable based on all of our experience. Uh, things that we learn, things that we read, things that we have intense experiences in, and in other words, on input, practice. So if I'm right-handed, I can develop, if I started playing, let's say, traditional grip, even though I consider myself more right-handed, left-handed, if I started playing traditional grip with my left hand in more of the match grip and right-handed, I would develop just as well as if I started the other way. So we respond to inputs. And when I say we, pianists, guitarists, violinists are, are a perfect example, uh, vibraphonists, timpanists, surgeons. Um, I'm working with uh, Jefferson Hospital, like I mentioned, and uh, there's a, a, uh, a researcher there who's also an emergency room doctor who considers herself left-handed, but she learned to suture with her right hand just by observing. Now, you know, we, we pick up sticks and, you know, we hit things to simplify. We're talking somebody with fine motor skills in their quote, non-dominant or weak hand that is suturing people to save their lives. So I, I think if that can be learned, in a relatively short period of time with your non-dominant or weak hand, I think we can do almost anything with our hands. We have, we have dived all the way into it. <laughs> I asked a simple Actually, question. My whole outline's out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A simple We're on question. Page 11. <laughs> We're on page 11 already. <laughs> I had I had two cups of coffee. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me backtrack just a little bit because uh, what I'd like to do is create a series of interviews with you and a series of conversations about the whole, you know, neurology and how the brain works and how it how it affects our practice, our our playing, our teaching, and all of those things. So one of the questions that I had early on was just. Um, the the idea that there are so many things that we are taught that just are handed down as kind of accepted fact or accepted because a person has been in a certain situation for you know their whole life and they don't think of anything else as being true so part of this is just questioning those facts it, yeah it, it's I think research, if you're really into research, you have a predisposition towards nonstop questioning. You have a predisposition towards not accepting things that that you hear uh, without really finding out the truth. Drums is a perfect example about tradition and things being just handed down and quote, you know, the, the right way. Um, Science has existed for a lot of years talking about handedness. Science has existed for a lot of years talking about physiology. But drums, to some degree, seem to have progressed in a bit of a vacuum without really studying research. I mean, listen, you, you can go to college and earn a PhD, master's degree in drums, 
and never have to take a course in physiology or anatomy or kinesiology or neurology or any of these things. We are visual learners. When we see people doing this, we just think, I guess that's the right way to do it. So I, I think more and more there are people like me, I'm not alone in this, but I think that more and more people are starting to question things. I mean, I remember growing up, going into, and you know, we were all, I was, you know, a snob because I took private. So I remember, you know, and, and, and traditionally, you know, this, this was the way to play. So I played this way for a lot of years. And I remember going into rock clubs and seeing drummers that have never taken lessons playing matched grip and doing amazing things around the kit. And I, I I'm looking at them thinking, well, I, I can't do that. So are they wrong? What's right? What's wrong? You know, these things that get handed down sometimes really get in our way of finding the truth and progressing because, you know, our teachers, professionals, et cetera, say certain things that really aren't based in fact or truth. It's not that they don't work. It's that there may be better ways to do things that we can only discover through questioning and research. Yeah. And it's not only questioning as far as questioning the method or the, the facts as they are, but questioning everything, questioning, does this sound as good as I think it does? Is my time as good as I think it is? Do I really, am I playing as musical uh, musically as I think I am? So it's, it goes, the questioning as a philosophy goes way beyond whether or not what my teacher told me is true or not. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. You just reminded me of a, uh, a story. One of my students came in and uh, I asked him what he's kind of working on for fun. And he said, well, I, you know, I, I found this little Gad trans Steve Gad transcription of, of this groove. And, you know, I'm kind of working on it. I said, great, let me let me hear it. And so he started to play it. And I said, uh, you know, do you really think that sounds like, yeah, I, I do think it sounds like, you know, I'm reading the trans transcription. And I said, okay, let's, uh, it, just a few years ago, let's put up your iPhone and let's, I, I want to record you just playing that groove. So I recorded them for 30, 60 seconds, whatever. I said, okay, now let's put on the Steve Gadd recording from that. Okay. So we're listening on these big speakers and we're listening to, you know, the amazing Steve Gadd play it. I said, okay, let's listen to you do it. And he listened <laughs> and he was kind of in shock. And he said exactly what you just said. I didn't know I sounded like that. I said, okay, you know, the, these iPhones are pretty amazing tools for us. And we have all these amazing tools that actually help us to understand if we're playing in time, if we're playing a good groove, if we sound musical, if our drums really sound and cymbals sound the way we think they do. So Mark, I, I have to ask, yeah. what is it about our, our brains that makes us think it sounds different than what it really does like why is it that if you record it and you listen back you're like that's not me it's like no that is you <laughs> it's the recording's not lying but what is it about our brains that like almost interprets it as being better than what it really is when we speak there's there there's a number of parts of our brain and it's not just the left side of our brain controls speech there are left and right parts of our brain that uh help us to sound out the words, help us to understand the words. So when we speak, and this, this is the same thing you're talking about, Joe, we think we sound a certain way, right? Yeah, I think I sound like, you know, Clark Gable or something, but because, well, apparently I don't. <laughs> you, look, you look like him. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm thinking better. <laughs> so, but when, when, we, when we speak, we're hearing our entire head now be a sound cavity. So we're not just hearing through our ears, we're hearing through our, our whole head. When we listen back, we're not hearing through our head, we're listening through our ears. So there's a difference in sound. When we're playing, we have, I mean, this is, this is a loud instrument to sit over top of and play. When we record, not only are we listening back 
more objectively, but we're listening with our objective ears versus our subjective ears. So we always sound different than we, we see. We and, and while you're playing, while you're playing, um, a lot of it is, is that part of your brain is concentrating on what you're doing, right? Versus what it is actually producing. Is that, is that part of it when you're thinking that I'm in time or thinking that I'm, that I actually have a great career or I have a great touch? You know what, that, that's a great question. And, and here's the phrase that responds to that. We hear what we expect to hear. So mm. if your focus is on trying to play and trying to play in time, your entire focus is not on hearing how your drum sound. Your focus is more on doing and playing. And so you're hearing what you expect to hear. You're not even questioning that when you're playing, which is why recording is such a critical issue, whether it's you're in a studio or you put your iPhone somewhere or somebody else stands off stage and records for you or your teacher records for you. Those things, that aspect of, and it's feedback is what it is. It's a feedback loop to be able to influence what you're doing by how it actually sounds and feels. Hey, so essentially if and when you start teaching a student or even if you're trying to learn yourself, if you incorporate that level of additional learning at the same time, that's the best way to do it because then you're, you're learning, okay, this is, I'm learning how to hear and how to play and from different angles, right? Right. It might, I don't know if I'm describing that correctly, but it kind of seems like that's what you have to do. And people like me suck because I never did that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like I, I only learned, I only learned just play, you know, I never, I never went back and listened and said, Oh, that's really not what I, I didn't, I'm really not that good. I got to fix that. And I never learned how to do that. Is that correct? But you're, you're exactly correct. The, the, the feed, my goal as a teacher, and I tell all my students this, my goal is to teach and I'm speaking to a student. My goal is to teach you how to learn, to teach you how to teach yourself, to teach you how to not need me. So I'm not, going to focus on, let's say, we're, today we're going to work on paradiddles, whatever. We're going to work on a, a simple jazz groove or a funk groove. I'm not just going to say to you, yeah, they're uneven. I'm going to put the iPhone up and record you and say, can you see the different levels of your hand? What that creates is different sound pressures, which equate into volume. So if you see that your hands are at different heights, it's pretty likely that the volumes are going to be different. So there, now I'm helping you to understand how to see and make adjustments with your eyes. Now we're gonna listen back and can you hear the difference in tone? Can you hear the difference when you're hitting the snare around the center versus on the edge? Can you hear the difference when you're hitting the ride cymbal an inch from the end? So my goal as a teacher is to teach you how to hear things and you can compare them to records. You can compare them to yourself. Also, I should say that I'm not a fan, although I do this uh, because I have to do it right now, teach a one hour private lesson each week. Maybe a half hour twice a week, maybe two hours every three weeks, but we've created this artificial schedule of we need one hour every week. Okay, mm. so, so let's say it's one hour a week. And so for the other six days and 23 hours, you're on your own. So you may have practiced and, you know, young students in college, they're practicing three, four, five, six hours a day. So now they practice this thing maybe not correctly without adjusting for 30 or 40 hours they've already started to wear a new neural pathway into how it should sound and look and feel no. and so we get together a week later it's like okay you practice this but you're developing it in the wrong way so that's why i tell my students record it and just send it to me don't practice mistakes. Don't just keep going over the same thing if you know it's wrong. 
that's for beginner students or sometimes even intermediate students. For advanced students, you can, you can learn that on your own. Joe, the, the fact that you just mentioned that you know this to be a flaw in how you practice means it's easy for you to correct. This is an easy Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's something I, I've been asking in a million different interviews, how do you practice, how do you practice? And everybody has a different thing, but I think the one common thing that all the really great players have is they knew how to practice. They were taught from the very beginning how to, how to do everything you're just saying, I think, in some kind of way, in some kind of fashion. And um, that way, it's like you're teaching someone how to critically think, but how to critically practice, I guess, maybe is a way to say it. And that way they can correct themselves on the spot. They've learned, you've taught them as a good teacher how to fix themselves as opposed to establish these bad habits and then, like you said, once you create that pathway in your brain, man, you can fix it, but it's, it's a lot more work to do that. Okay. We have gone into okay. right. another episode of the, uh, <laughs> out of practice. Uh, this one sorry, was supposed Mark. to be on handedness and, <laughs> oh yeah, let's go back to handedness. Right. Sorry. Right. sorry. That is a, that, uh, how to practice and, and all of that is an, <laughs> an extremely important topic and I wish I want to make sure that we cover that in its own uh in its own session but let's go back to handedness because we <laughs> we have been trained our entire lives to think I'm right-handed I'm left-handed and there's a certain amount well I'm just speculating that there might be a certain amount of heredity that's based in that perception uh but as it applies to drumming tell us why right-handed people are not automatically better at their right hand than they are their left hand. We, we, we learn, again, we're, we're humans are predominantly visual learners. So we see people doing things and that's, that's part of it. The, the, the question really is, do I write with my right hand because that's what I've been told to do or because it's a preference? Because it's not a weak hand, at some point there is a combination of genetics, observation, and preference. Okay, but we're talking about writing. If you or I, you know, let's say we injured our hand in some way, pulled a tendon or something, and we we couldn't write for two months, what would we do? Let's say let's say it's twenty years ago when we needed the hand actually write things. If we stop doing it with our right hand, we can develop a new neural pathway with our left hand that not overwrite the existing pathway, but develop a new one. Joe, what you said a couple of minutes ago is, is very true, is that imagine a, a giant field that's overgrown with weeds and we walk across this field the first day. OK, we're bending some of the weeds down, but there's no path. We do that for a couple of months. And now there's a path. We do it for a couple of years, and now grass is not growing at all there. If we decide to do something with our left hand, we don't overwrite that path. We build a new one, which means we can have bimanual skills. If you look at violinists at 70, depending on the culture, where you what country you live in, let's say it's somewhere between 75, 85, 90% of our population self-identifies as being right-handed, okay? So now you have a violin and they all play in the orchestra. They all play, all these professional violinists, they, they hold with their, their, I'm not doing this right, but they hold with their, their left hand and they bow with their quote, dominant hand. But if you look at the size of the fingerboard that these, all of these violinists are playing on, it's what? And it, two inches, an inch and a half, and they're they're the four strings, and they are with their quote weak hand, moving with breathtaking speed and accuracy over all these notes, and that's supposed to be their weak hand. If you're a violinist, your teacher doesn't say, "Are you right-handed or left-handed?" Your teacher says, "Here's how you hold the violin." Well, I'm right-handed. Here's how you hold the violin. This is the hand that you use to press on the strings and find the notes. This is the hand that you use on your bow. You go and see an orchestra, they're all 
holding the violin because they don't want to hit their stand partner. One's bowing this way, one's bowing that way. The same thing is true of vibraphonists. Same thing is, it, it's a, you don't see saxophonists doing this. Part of it is we have grown accustomed to not asking questions, like, like you said earlier. So we just accept. And the fact is that, yes, you can learn to play like this equally well as like this or like this or like this or some other way because our hands are amazing and what we're asking them to do in playing drums is not nearly close to the maximum that they're capable of doing so we can learn to play anyway so well, here, here's a question on that yeah even though you can play anyway is it still better maybe functionality to play a certain way? Like in other words, do your muscles and your hands function better this way as opposed to, you know, whatever way, you know? Yeah, well, yeah you, can, you can do it, but would it be, is it physically better to do it one way or the other? I start off students playing match grip. The motion of your hands and, and, and our, our muscles all pull. They contract. They don't. We push. It said that we push something, but we push based on muscles contracting. So when we bring the stick down, it's this large muscle, which is one of the largest muscles we have in our forearm, contracts to bring the stick down. The stick bounces back up, so we don't need to bring it back up. If we're playing traditional grip, yes, you can learn to do it that way. And you see so many modifications of where the fingers are, where the thumb is, where the hand movement is. But this rotation is more limited in terms of its range of motion than this movement. So can you learn to do it this way? Yeah. Might you have to practice longer hours to get these smaller muscles to be equal in terms of sound and control with these larger muscles? Yeah, you might have to practice longer with your quote, we can. I remember a teacher telling me one time, for every hour you practice with your right hand, you need to practice two hours with your left hand. And I was kind of a smart aleck. I know it's hard to believe, but I, I remember saying to him, uh, why don't I just practice for three hours with both my hands? Uh, that, that earned me a B that one <laughs> but yeah if I'm starting somebody off so i mean this this if somebody wants to go this way then go that way so this uh leaving the traditional grip uh question aside because uh, that's another we can one, actually yeah. that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation because we haven't right, gotten right. into the fingers and everything else but so you know it, it is pretty natural that uh players when they start playing drums are, you know, dominant hand and one hand is stronger and one hand is weaker, but mm -hmm. that relates to what they're coming into learning to play the drums with, right? Exactly right. When we start to play drums, let's say we're right-handed and we're 14, 16, whatever, 50 years old, it doesn't matter. And we've considered ourselves right-handed we will have done more things with our right hand than with our left hand. So all of those little things, whether it's handwriting, you know, picking something up, cooking with knife, you know, cutting meat, whatever it is, we have through development and practice over the years, developed more skills in our right hand. Uh, doesn't mean our left hand is weaker. It's just not as developed. So again, and neuroplasticity says factually that our brains are a result of what we practice, what we learn. It's input. So if all we've done is input this hand into doing everything, then that part of our brain is more developed. If and when we start to practice, then it will equal out. When you start to play, and let's say it's a beginning student playing uh, and they're 12 years old, whatever, and they're going to pick up the sticks and they're going to start to play this way. Yeah, they've been doing things if they're right handed, predominantly with the right hand for a bunch of years. So it will not look even. It will not sound even. That's where practice comes in, because this is a 
result of neural development and practice and input. So like Joe's earlier question, that's where the teacher comes in to say, okay, if you see your hands at these different levels, the sound pressure, the volume, sound is not going to be the same. So let's start by making sure that they look the same. And you can do that visually. You could do it with your phone. And then let's record it to see how it sounds. But yes, it, you, we all start off if we're right-handed or if we're left-handed, say we start off like this, but through practice, it catches up. That's what practice is. That's what neuroplasticity is. That's why these amazing developments over the last 10 or 15 years are so impactful with life in general, not just drumming. And, and a lot of that has to do with how we choose, you know, like the, the, the biggest thing that we choose to do is to put our hi-hat here and to have it high so that we can get it out of the way of our left hand. Um, and then, you know, like the, the difficulty of playing open-handed has little to do with the, the development of your skill sets, right? It has more to do with getting your hi-hat where, you, where it actually wow. works for your left hand. You know what? Open-handed is 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 it's a very interesting situation because yeah, my hi hat right now. I was practicing something yesterday, and it was a right hand dominant thing that I'm doing over here, cross-handed, because that neural pathway has been developed over 45 to 50 years of playing. I'm not going to take another 50 years to, to just copy that open-handed. I already do it well that way. I don't need to change it. But I'm also working on a sango where I'm playing, let's say on, on this cowbell or another cowbell or the hat, I'm playing the quarters and maybe half notes with my left hand so I can get around the drums this way. I can choose to put another cowbell over here, which I have, but since this is a new pattern that I'm learning, why not choose the open-handed, cross-handed, whatever you want to call it? Why not choose the technique I'm going to use that matches what I'm trying to do instead of saying, no, no, I'm right-handed, so I'm going to have to learn to do this. No, if it's something new, we don't have a neural pathway yet developed. We can choose to play open-handed or close-handed. Yeah, I love that about your article. And you said, like, look, look, you've already spent all those years practicing one way. Don't try to relearn that way. That's a waste of time. Just anything new, maybe. A, a, were, do you get scared? Did you at first get scared about starting that out? Like, were you like, all right, I got to do I believe this or do I not believe this? Like, if I spent all this time starting to do something with my left hand lead, like the, at the beginning, when you it, when you had to learn that new song, be like. To where you kind of hesitant, like, I don't think I, I don't know if I can do that with my left hand or <laughs> listen, <laughs> if, if, if you see great drummers and let's say they're playing jazz time with the right hand while their left hand is playing all these little intricate ghost notes and rhythm. And that's supposed to be their weak hand yeah. or they're playing crossed and their right hand's playing straight eights and their left hand's playing all these ghost notes, 16s and things. And it's like, how can that be their weak hand? So if you're learning something new, and, and when I started to approach this, I made the mistake of thinking, okay, I, I believe that it will give me more flexibility around the kit to play open-handed. So I made the mistake of starting with things that I already have had neural pathways worn for decades doing this way. It didn't feel good. It didn't feel the same. It didn't sound the same. So I'm thinking maybe this is wrong. But then I started to research and say, well, this neural pathway is so deep over God knows how many thousands of hours and strokes, I'm not gonna change that. So let me, instead of trying something that I've already worn this pathway for 30, 40, 50 years, let me try something new. Let me try something that I don't have a new, that I don't have a neural pathway developed. So can my left hand play half notes? I would hope so. Can my left hand while I'm doing that play some eighths or whatever? Or 
I, I hope it can. The, the brain has this amazing ability that if we learn something with our right hand, let's say it's jazz time, and we've been playing it for 30 years, right, this way. If we say, oh, let me try playing that with our left hand, we can play it. It may not feel as good if we've been doing it with our right hand for 30 years. It may not sound exactly the same, but can we develop a skill? If we have, let's say, you know, I have my china over here, but let's say I have my china up here and I want to work on some kind of a shuffle groove. Can I learn to do that with my left hand? while my right hand is moving around here? Absolutely. Will it feel exactly the same as if I did it here? It might feel better. It depends on how we practice. You said it before, we get stuck on what to practice. So we line up our method books and there's some great books, no problem with those. But when we're done going through this book, page 26 and 27, this book, these next five, and, it, and we've, done, we've done it for two hours, we think we're done practicing. We've just started to scratch the surface of questioning ourselves about what we're doing, why we're doing it. And Mark, you had mentioned it, how we even set up. I mean, I, I have a snare drum over here. You know, you, you see, Dave Weckle, he's got, he, I think I saw a photo recently where he had a snare drum on the right side. I mean, people can move things around and you see some amazing size kits, but the fact is we can learn to play any way we want. And, and it's actually, and it might be actually advantageous to switch it up so that your right hand is forced to do ghost notes and learn the finer motor skills of playing in between the the ride pattern if, and all of that if, right if we're let's say we're playing eight notes over here on the hat and we're playing some intricate little you know ghost note pattern here with our left hand what happens if if we want to go over here to this tom or over here to this tom or over here to something else why don't we learn to do that with this hand so I have a, a bunch of, I have a whole series of, here's grooves that I've started to learn that specifically <clears throat> lend themselves to open hand playing. If I'm just gonna stay on the snare and I've been doing that for 30 years, I'm gonna stay on the snare and I'm gonna cross. But for something that I wanna get these sounds, yeah, I'm gonna play the hi-hat with my left hand. And back to what you said before, Mark, yeah, it is an issue with the height of the hi-hat if you're playing open-handed if i'm playing open-handed i'm going to lower this a little bit okay i can also put a hi-hat over here if i want i can put something else over here a, a remote 10 inch hi-hat that are close I, you can do a lot of things with equipment but this makes it a little more challenging with the height but if you think about the challenge that we all faced and sometimes still face trying to get volume on the snare while crossing underneath the right hand on the hat, it, to me, that's a, that's a much bigger challenge than adjusting the hi-hat a couple of inches down. Because now you're changing your whole grip, you're changing your posture. You may not even be hitting the drum in the right place. But, so it, again, all of this comes back to question, why am I doing it this way? Is this really the best way? Isn't there a better way? How come I see these drummers doing it this way, open hand? They sound good. That seems to work. Maybe I should try some of that. Right. And a lot of it has to do with what you want to achieve. I mean, if you're playing massive backbeats, <laughs> it, it would stand a reason that, I don't know, playing match grip would be the first thing, because if you're trying to play massive backbeats with your left hand, you, you know, in a traditional grip, you're, you're not utilizing all the weight of your arm. Of course, I'm, I'm throwing in every preconceived notion I have, which every time I get around you, I, you know, I stumble into, well, why do you think that way? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we, we, our bodies, our brains are the most amazing thing. 
So we learn to adjust our technique in all kinds of ways because we have, it's been handed down that crossed is the right way to play. Crossed is one way to play. It's a way to play. It's not the right way. It's not the wrong way. It's one way to play. But if by playing this way, we have to adjust everything else, including our posture, our technique, how much arm we're using, where we're coming from, the angle of attack, if we have to adjust all that, might there be a better way? Might there be an easier way where we don't have to make all those physical adjustments? You, you don't have to make any physical adjustments here. Yeah. The only if, if, you do is if you think about, out. if you think about, you know, the, the reason why most young students have problems balancing the sound on their kit and they're playing their hi-hat way too loud, a lot of it just has to do with they feel like they have to do this to get, get the hands out of the way. So then they're forced into that kind of velocity or that kind of motion with their right hand, where if the hands weren't crossing, they probably would not have that problem with balance. Yeah, that's a good point. You mentioned it. If, if we're playing with our right hand, this in physics is a lever, right? If we're just playing with our wrist, the lever extends from the rotation of your wrist to the tip of the stick. If we're playing with an arm, now we have this long of a lever, which means we can move this a lot faster because it's traveling greater distance, which means it's going to be louder. So if we're playing this way here and we have a, a little motion here, how is that? How is this lever, which is now this long, with a smaller muscle ever going to compete with this lever, which is this long? It, it can't. It, mm -hmm. Physically, it can't. So that's when we start to make physical modifications of how we're playing. I've seen people do this. Mm -hmm. I've seen drummers do this. Okay. We don't need to make those physical modifications. There is physiologically a better way. Can, can we still play drums this way? Absolutely. And if you've been doing it your whole life or 20 years and want to continue that, absolutely. it's not wrong. But science and medicine have now unequivocally proved that there are some better ways. When NASA launched the, the first space shuttles, right? And they were trying to determine the, whichever astronaut it was that sat in the, the bay door or whatever they sit, and they launch this $5 billion satellite from the, the inside the shuttle out into space, they're going to sit at a, a bimanual control. They have two controls. This is a $5 billion satellite. This is not playing eighth notes. And so they tried to determine, should this be a right-handed person? Should it be a left-handed person? How do we make this set of tools here, should we make it right hand or left hand or how should we do it? And what, this is NASA, determined over a couple of years of research just into this is it doesn't matter because we can develop the skill with any pilot to be able to use these bimanual controls. It doesn't need to be right hand oriented, it doesn't need to be left hand oriented. Next time you're flying in a plane, look look at a photograph of what the cockpit looks like and the quote right-handed pilot on the stick, you know, controlling the 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 motion of the plane and the right hand on the engines. Well, is this? Uh, I'm thinking this is maybe more fine motor skills here, but that's their weak hand. Mm -hmm. And so, all of um, go ahead, Joe. I I just had a question that maybe. It, pertaining to the it, the same thing we're talking about but you said that like if if you if you've been playing this way your whole life well don't rewrite that pathway right because it's already there my question is do you also have a pathway though when you're reading for example typically if you're reading and you're looking at the hi-hat line or you're looking at the ride symbol line you think right hand so that's a learned pathway i would think of some sort so even if you say, okay, this is a new pattern and I want to learn it leading with my left, do you have to, there's a bit of rewriting that has to happen to saying, well, when I'm reading that line, it's this hand now, right? Is that true? 
I, I, it's hard for me to believe that you just raised this question. I just read this research paper the other day by this neuroscientist, uh, Lucy Patston is, is her name. She said with musicians, right? The fact that we are reading and we become accustomed to reading, let's say the top line is hi-hat or ride symbol, whatever it is, it, meaning right hand and the, you know the snare, whatever means left hand. Yes, it's harder for us. And I've noticed this about myself. I can develop an, a neural pathway. I can work on a skill open-handed and that transfers much easier then when I look at a notated drum part and I try to do that open handed because my brain right. has learned that means this hand. That's a rewiring of my visual cortex or part of my cortex to be able to say, no, 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 that's not your right hand anymore. That's your left hand. That's a whole different thing than just playing open handed. And I have difficulty with that because i'm not I, i've been playing for 50 years i haven't been reading you know when we practice we don't read all the time but that way of understanding and equating what we're seeing into our hands is a different pathway than just the plane so what i now do is sometimes i'll play it just to see the pattern and understand how it sounds and then I'll stop looking at it because I've memorized the one or two bar pattern into how it sounds. And then my hands start to move in the opposite way. But if I'm looking at that hi hat line and now I'm trying to tell myself, no, that's that's my left hand. Yeah, because it's like looking yeah. at the word and and trying to say the right. Like, and it's the same oh. thing. It's the same thing with, you yeah. know, like outside of the drum set and outside of the, how it's notated on the staff. Just reading rhythm patterns, you know, if you're just here's a bunch of 16th permutations. I've been doing a right handed lead system for so long that I have to actually put thought into if I want to do left handed or if I want to do a double sticking or I have to think about what that is, even though I can read all the rhythms on the page. Exactly right. I, I tell I tell students. And I know we're jumping to. I'm not going to jump ahead into learning a practice, but <laughs> that only look at the page for as long as you need to. And the question is, how much do you really need to stare at a page to understand or to start playing 16th rhythms? Now, here, here's, here's part of, uh, I'm going to let you in on, on how much of a nerd I really am. Take one measure of 16th notes, right? Well, let's take one measure of eighth notes. And there's eight different places you can have a note or a rest. You know how many combinations there are of either zero eighth notes, one eighth note, and different places in one measure? 256. You know how many there are in one measure of sixteenths? It's like 63,000 some. No book is going to have every combination of just one measure. So how do we learn those things? My what I tell my students is don't become over dependent on being able to play only when you see, because you're not going to have those books or those notes or anything when you're live in concert. It, maybe you have something there as a guide or a little cheat sheet or something, but if you've only learned to look, if you've only learned to process that with your hands when you're looking at it, and now you're trying to move away from it. It's a different skill. It's a different pathway. It's a different learning protocol. And a so completely different conversation. Let me let me ask one more question as it relates to handedness. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, Mark. Reel you back in. Um, <laughs> so we talked about neural pathways as it relates to you know learning a new skill and adapting, you know. Um, your muscle memory. How does muscle memory and the development of actual muscles relate to those neural pathways? 
it, it's, it's funny, but muscle memory is actually a misnomer because our muscles don't really have memories. The memories are, are, are the neural pathways that, you know, ha how the neurons and, you know, trigger, you know, they come out of our brain, they come down of our spine, they go into our muscles and they trigger the movements. So our, our, it's not our muscles that, that memorize that because, I mean, my muscles don't look any different than anybody else's. It's um, it's an it's a neural memory. Hmm. It, what we're doing is a neural memory. The same way, and, and I know this is a, a kind of a future topic, but I was I had a concert last night with one of my ensembles, and I was bringing a, a shaker up. I was walking through the hall, and I was walking at a certain tempo, and I started to play around with shaking it in completely different tempos. And it didn't affect the tempo of my walking. That's not a muscle memory. That's a neural memory. You can isolate those things because this neural memory of walking has been developed for me decades. That I'm, I don't have to think. You don't have to think when you walk. It's a neural memory. It's a neural pathway. So I can concentrate on this as I'm walking and not even think about walking it's the same thing we do when we're playing it's the so, exact same thing we do. so that's how daphnis frito can <laughs> like Check. or any any uh musician who is we call it interdependence or independence or you know we call it that but really what it is is a neural pathway that operates in a completely separate zone as a different neural path pathway it, exactly. And, and some, some of the ways that, that we learn, and, and I can demonstrate because this is, and I'm not going to now, but I can play, let's say, a tumbao rhythm with my left foot uh, on a cowbell or woodblock or hi-hat playing half notes and my bass drum playing the end of two and four. And I can play uh, with that, play solo around the drums. I can play in a different time with my hands. I can play out of time with my hands. It's not talent. It's, it's a neural pathway that has been developed and there's specific ways to do that. We can do the same thing if we're playing eighth notes on the hi-hat. We can do the same thing if our hi-hat's playing two and four. It's the exact same thing. It's a neural pathway. How long does it take to create a neural pathway? It depends on the intricacy of the neural pathway. If you're talking something of a duration of let's say clave with your left foot or clave with your left hand on a bell as you're doing something else to get it comfortable it may take it'll take a few months it, it, not just to create that pathway but to make it independent to where it, it becomes the term is automatized so you don't have to think about it like we're walking you don't have to think about it you can do it while you're doing anything else over here it something involved like that because it's a two bar rhythm that take that is inconsistent. It takes two bars to repeat and it's and it's starting and stopping different places. If you're playing hi hat on quarters or hi hat on two and four, that may only take a few weeks. That may take, let's say generally, Joe, the answer is about eight weeks, eight to ten weeks. But if if you're just doing this with your hi hat, my neural pathway doesn't care whether this, this is quarter notes. This could be eighth notes. It could be upbeat eighth notes. It could be dotted quarter. It could be anything. It's a consistent pattern movement that is not a ballistic movement, which is clave is there's stops and starts. That takes longer than a consistent movement that oh, doesn't change. Interesting. Jazz interesting. time. Eighth notes, it's a lot easier to develop that neural pathway than, let's say, a cascara rhythm. Because there's a lot of stops and starts. And it takes, a, it's a longer, I call it a sentence length. I had easy. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So all of this, and I'm going to wrap this up because we could keep going and keep going. <laughs> And we Mark, can just we, go down different we, pathways in our conversation. <laughs> That's what this series should be called, Pathways. <laughs> I, like, I like that, Joe. <laughs> but 
Yeah. So um, if there's any takeaway that you would that you would encourage students as far as the, the thinking process and the practicing process of of handedness, what would be the one thing that's your biggest takeaway from what you learned and your research? Trust the science. Our hands and brains are way more amazing than we give them credit for sometimes in terms of drumming. Drumming is not in a vacuum, in a separate universe. Everything that applies to everything else in life, physics, science, it applies to drums. Ask questions. Don't sell yourself short. Experiment. Try new things constantly. Try different setups. Try playing different things. And the one word I tell my students, the most important word uh, to learn this instrument is patience. Just keep asking questions and patience because if you've been playing something for 10 years this way and you try it this way, it's not going to feel comfortable. It's, it's not. Play it for 10 years that way and maybe it will. But why would you do that if you can already do it that way? Mm. Question everything and just patience and especially when it comes to tradition and things that have been handed down, the best word you can use is why. Why? Why is that the right? Why is that the right way? And if somebody can give you the data to support it, then listen to them. And, and I, I tell people all the time: Listen, uh, I'm I'm on a journey here that will never end. As is science, figuring out how our brains, nervous systems, bodies, how everything works, and and it will go on forever. Mine will go on till the, the day I die. Will I know more a year from now, five years from now than I do today? Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to listen to what I say and you don't like it, fine. That's opinion. I have no problem with that. If you, if you're a scientist or you have found some better pathways that I've mentioned, please en enlighten me, help, help me. My goal is, is, to never say anything that I can't back up with science and, and research. I don't want to make things up. And so if somebody wants to help enlighten me, move me further down this road, I, I, I completely welcome them. We're all on this journey together. We're all just trying to help each other. You're not trying to win. You're trying to find the truth. <laughs> Oh, I thought it was all about winning. I, I didn't know. I was... <laughs> well, Mark, I, I want to thank you for taking the time and you know discussing this one topic or these fifteen you know open pathways to new topics that we will continue with um, for today's for today's project in the uh, learning the brain. We still have to figure out a a great title for this, but. Well, I, li I like the, the pathways thing and, and Mark, I'll, I'll give you a lot of credit because you're kind of the, the guy that reels me back in and, but Joe is the antagonizer. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. I'm not Joe. trying to do that. I just, I, I love this stuff so much that I, I can't, I'm always, and maybe it's bad that I'm on this. <laughs> no, maybe it's bad that I'm on this because everything that you ask, I get excited about and, and it's, oh no, yeah talk about this and so no this is this is good maybe freewheeling pathway i don't know some kind of title mark but these are kind of great discussions i love talking to you guys about this and and i thank you for taking the interest to ask me about this you know i'm i'm just a guy on the road somewhere to try to find out better information where everybody can learn and when we do at some point get into some of the research that I'm doing with Jefferson Hospital, that's a whole other thing about how drumming can help rehabilitate uh, people with, uh, you know, uh, neurogenital diseases, with, with stroke patients, it, 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 people that have been injured, et, et cetera. So that's a whole other thing. And I'm working with some people at Peabody as well to discuss how drumming, not even a drum set, just hand, finger movement, and foot movement aligned with what we hear can help heal the brain. 
So yeah, the, the, and we'll get into that in another discussion. Actually, what I would like to do is at some point we can we can do a live discussion because I know that uh, people out there, you know, have immediate questions. They have they have their own comments. They have their own um, you know yeah ways that they would like to take the conversation. So maybe we can we can do a little bit of live conversation in addition to recording these as well. But I'm going to end it here. Because we're <laughs> Joe, we got, you and I, are, we'll keep talking. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, appreciate thank you, Mark. It. Until until next time. Thank you, right. thank you both. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care, brother. Bye bye.